Welcome back. Doug Lamborn, a man who I've had the privilege of knowing and working with now for quite some time from his perspective as a representative of the people of the 5th District in Colorado, a member of the House Armed Services Committee, um, vice chairman of its Strategic Forces Subcommittee, also a member of the House Committee on Natural Resources, Veterans Affairs, a very, very important and influential legislator. We're always delighted to have him with us, especially on the um, the occasion of the president's veto of one of your major legislative initiatives, uh, Congressman Lamborn, the National Defense Authorization Act. Welcome back. It's good to have you with us, sir. Well, Frank, I appreciate the work you do to promote our national security. Thanks. Let's talk about this National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, It's not every day that the President of the United States wields his veto pen to strike this legislation down. Remind our listeners, Doug, if you would, what's this bill about? Why is it important? And then we'll talk about why the President has seen fit to, uh, to veto it. There are two bills that deal with the military each year. The first is the authorization bill, which this is, which describes all of the programs, sometimes new programs uh, that have to be opened up or modifications in existing programs, other changes. And then the appropriators give the money for in a separate bill for all of those changes. And they might even have some input as well on where the dollars go. And the two of those make the package. This president has vetoed the NDAA, the Authorization Act for this year, and the first time in history it's ever been vetoed for something that's not even in the bill itself. Hmm. This is sort of the crux of the matter, I think, but um, there is one provision of this legislation that apparently the president uh, found particularly objectionable, and it happens that uh, at least it sounds as though the administration has uh, Colorado in mind as a, as a place that uh, would have bearing on this objection. Give us a flavor of the legislation's current treatment of the Guantanamo Bay prison and the disposition of its uh, jihadist de- <laughs> detainees and why the president seems to be interested in your state as a place to put them. I know that this is this is a specific thing in the bill. The, the other issue is he just wants to get more funding for outside projects in other parts of the budget unrelated to the military. And that that shouldn't even be a reason for veto. But on this issue, and we will come back to that, but on Gitmo itself, Frank, like you pointed out, the bill says there will be no funds for uh, no ability of power to transfer these people to U.S. soil. And the president does not like that. He wants to shut down Guantanamo Bay. He feels like that's an incitement to people that just hate our way of life. Even if he had his way, God forbid, they would find other reasons, and they have other reasons to hate us because of their perverse philosophy. So, Frank, it was not going to help at all. In fact, it'll do a lot of harm. You send these people to U.S. soil, you'll have federal judges giving them constitutional rights, which will make it almost impossible to try them because it'll force the disclosure of method, uh, means and operations, methods and operations that we use for our most sensitive intelligence gathering, they'll get into prison, in the, into the civilian population, and start radicalizing. There will be security threats. Uh, people will find ways to do harm to our facilities and our personnel, some of whom are my constituents because they want to bring some of these people possibly to Colorado even. So, Frank, it's just bad on so many fronts. What kinds of prisons are they talking about uh, possibly putting them in in Colorado? I I saw one, I think, was a state penitentiary. Is it your judgment, uh, Congressman Doug Lamborn, that those facilities are going to be adequate to deal with uh, threats from uh, perhaps outside to them or certainly to uh, the safe incarceration of these guys, even if the federal judges uh, don't uh, muck things up? Frank, I, I think it, whether they can be sprung loose, I don't, I, I, I don't know about that, if, if the bad guys could pull that off. But they could certainly bring uh, violence and, and death to the people guarding the place, going to work in these places, uh, coming home from work at these places. The, sur- the surrounding communities, too. Yeah, they, they could give it their best shot and do a lot of damage. Whether they would actually spring people free, that I don't know. There is a state and federal facility both that they're looking at. Yeah. 
This is ill-advised in the extreme, and uh, the the bipartisan majorities that have uh, consistently been blocking this kind of action uh, are, are, you know, the sort of thing that you'd think would cause the president to uh, to relent, but uh, he seems to be doubling down. Let's turn to the other issue that you raised, uh, Congressman Doug Lamborn, and you're right, it, it is outrageous that the president seems to be trying essentially to euchre uh, further, well, pork barrel spending, perhaps you might call it, or at least additional domestic spending um, that uh, may or may not be justified on the backs of our military personnel. How is that being seen uh, by members of Congress? I, I, I would think that that would be an affront uh, even for some Democrats who've uh, recognized the importance of this legislation. Well, Frank, there was a lot of support in both the House and the Senate by Democrats for the NDAA as it passed. So there's a fighting chance of getting an override which takes two-thirds of both the House and the Senate. In fact, the Senate vote was more than two-thirds. Uh, but we fell a little bit short in the House, but well over a majority, well over 50 percent. The fact that he wants leverage, he's using the, our men and women in uniform and our national security as a pawn uh, to, to leverage his, his demand that we spend more money on his pet projects. And the American people are sick and tired of the IRS, the EPA, these, uh, these bureaucracies running roughshod over, over us. And they don't want to give them even more money. But yet the president and the, the looming $18 trillion plus national debt that we have, we have to get spending under control. He's going in the opposite direction on the backs of our military. Amen. Congressman, let me turn to one other provision in this legislation, the National Defense Authorization Act, with which I know you have been particularly involved. Uh, you represent uh, some of the people most immediately um, providing for our space uh, capabilities, uh, particularly national security space capabilities uh, out in Colorado. Um, what is going on, as you see it, with respect to threats to um, our ability to operate in the high frontier, as it's been called, and to, if necessary, project power from there? Uh, and, you know, the counterpart efforts being made by those who might deny us such capabilities, notably communist China. Well, Frank, Space used to be a sanctuary. It is no longer a sanctuary. We know that China and, to a lesser extent, Russia have tremendous capabilities that could do harm to key assets we have in space for communications, for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and for other vital military missions for our warfighters and for our security, you know, detecting incoming possible, you know, God forbid, nuclear ballistic missiles. There are all kinds of things we need space for, and our near peers, China and Russia, are very well aware of what our assets are, and now they're developing the technology to do something about it, and we have to fight back. And what does the defense authorization bill do in that regard uh, to assure that we have, in fact, the kind of capabilities we need for space control? Well, General Hyten, who runs Space Command, has a major new initiative to expand our ability to do just this, to develop the capabilities to stay in front technologically of what the Russians and Chinese are trying to do. And if we veto this bill and it's sustained, we don't know, we, we can't initiate new programs or do major modifications of existing programs. We just have to, at best, continue with existing programs in a rigid, lockstep fashion without any amendments or changes possible. And even there, funding becomes an issue because funding might run out. So we, we are in deep trouble if the president gets his way. He's playing with our national security in a dangerous way, Frank. At a dangerous time. Congressman Doug Lamborn of the 5th District of Colorado, I salute you for your leadership, particularly on trying to get a major force program introduced here on the space control front, both to deter our adversaries and to assure our security and our economic well-being, as you say. Keep up that good work, sir. Come back to us again, if you would, very soon. In the meantime, um, we appreciate all that you're doing. And Stephen Groves from the Heritage Foundation joins us next to talk about the evisceration of the Senate's role in treaty making and what it might mean for you. Straight ahead. 